Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here at ESMUD Paris for our roundtable on career paths in the fashion and luxury industries. My name is Janan Fugel. I work here at ESMUD Paris as a admissions officer and communications manager. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Paulina Mena, who is our admissions officer in Hello. charge of international student applications. Hi, everyone. We are here today to discuss uh, not only the career paths that are accessible to SMUD students once they've received their degrees, but also to the changes that are happening within the industry and how those changes are impacting the possible career paths and job opportunities for our students once they graduate. So to all of you parents who are watching, please rest assured that although your child may be interested in entering this creative field, there are plenty of job opportunities and career paths that they have open to them. During our discussion today, we will focus on three main topics, corporate social responsibility, or CSR, the digital revolution, and entrepreneurship. Today, these topics are absolutely synonymous with the fashion industry. The France, uh, here in France, the textile and garment industry is ranked as the third largest industry behind the food and machine slash equipment industries. And there are nearly 24,000 companies that are referenced in France uh, alone, which is a significant number that creates many jobs here in France, but also internationally, because as we know, the fashion industry is a global one. To give you some insight on these topics, um, we will hear from several distinguished alums that are with us today, as well as a recruiting consultant. But before I introduce them to you, I first will take a little bit more about ESMUD. ESMUD was founded in 1841 by master tailor, fashion theorist, and inventor Alexi Levine. In fact, this year, we are celebrating our 180th anniversary. Um, just a few weeks ago, we had a weeks-long worth of events for the occasion, culminating in an international fashion show at the historic and gorgeous Hotel Potuki, as well as a vast uh, exhibit of our archives at our own fashion business campus. Um, ESMUD, since its founding, has been dedicated to educating young creative minds on the techniques and savoir-faire, or expertise, in design and pattern making. But we are not just any fashion school. We are a network of schools, including 19 campuses in 13 different countries all around the world. In addition, a little over 30 years ago, we had our fashion business school that was founded, um, which gives students a 360 degree view of everything that has to do with the business of fashion. Um, this branch is dedicated to creative management and uh, educates students, uh, just as our fashion design school does, either in undergraduate or postgraduate programs. Uh, we are also very proud to have our in-house publishing house, Esmond Editions, uh, that puts together our uh, traditional methods with contemporary illustrations to create our textbooks and now our e-books. And finally, we have our Esmond Pro branch, which is dedicated to furthering, continuing, and completing the education of those that are already in the fashion industry. Because as I already mentioned, the industry changes quickly, and we have to change right along with it. Um, so I will now ask my colleague Paulina to tell us a little bit more about the programs that we offer here at ESMUD. Thank you, Janan. Um, so at ESMUD, we have two main fields of formation. One is fashion design, and the other one is fashion business. In the first field of uh, uh, knowledge, we have fashion design, where you will be learning how to transform all your artistic sensibility and ideas into something concrete. And how would you do so? by mo mostly focusing in two core skills for any fashion designer. Um, styling and pattern making. Styling is everything related to your, uh, to your uh, uh, ideas, the artistic references, the inspirations that you have. And pattern making is the technical aspect of fashion design. So you will take your idea in styling and transform it into a volume by using different materials and uh, techniques. 
In the second field of knowledge, we have fashion business, where you will be becoming the business partner of the fashion designer. And how to do so? Well, by training yourself in core skills like marketing, communications, in designing how you will be selling a product, how you will be approaching your customers. So you will be the link between the designer, the product, and the consumer or the market. And in these two fields, we have both undergrad and postgrad levels uh, that are recognized by the French government. Thank you, Paulina. Um, so for those of you watching at home, uh, please be aware that at the end of this roundtable discussion, we will be taking questions. So whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, feel free to ask any questions that you have uh, in the comments, and we will get to that at the very end. Um, so now, without further ado, let us please introduce the distinguished panel that we have with us today for our roundtable, starting with Itsuko, uh, who is an adjunct professor here at SMUD um, and also an independent business consultant and resources investigator. Hello, Itsuko. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Itsuko. I have a legal and pol public policy background, which is quite uh, unexpected in the fashion industry. I've been um, in the public sphere for 10 years, and then I switched to the, what we call in France uh, the cultural and creative industries about 11 years ago. And um, in the past 10 years, I've been working on the work organization and recruiting, recruitment of it for fashion industry. And when we speak about fashion, it includes also um, garments, accessories, but also jewelries and so on. Um, for small and big companies, uh, I, can I mention names? Or? Absolutely, please do. <laughs> <in fact. laughs> so the smallest one was Mayette, uh, which was a very <laughs> independent um, uh, project um, led by a former UNDP uh, executives, and which were really um, training. Uh, people in Africa and in underdeveloped countries um, to um, really focus on their savoir-faire and skills. And the, hu the big largest one was, I suppose, either Descartes or Gucci, uh, the very large mega brands uh, on, in luxury, but also in everyday wear and outer wear. And um, that's pretty much it. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, now we are introducing Ines Chabou. Welcome, Ines. Uh, no, no. She started here her journey at uh, ESMOD by doing a bachelor degree in, ba in fashion design and then continue her studies into uh, the postgrad program in uh, fashion business. And you have worked as a stylist, uh, also in writing content in marketing and communications, and currently as a client experience manager at uh, the brand APC. So welcome and tell us mm, your Thank journey. you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, after, just after my high school, I began in Esmode Roubaix in the north of France um, during three years old. Uh, and after that, uh, I joined Esmode in fashion business. The, the other section, uh, and after that I continue in the other school, uh, yeah, and now I'm a customer success manager at APC, uh, APC it's a Parisian brand for menswear and womenswear. Thank you, Inez. Welcome. <laughs> also joining us today, we have a recent fashion business alumna, Anna Iota, uh, who is currently working at Gaz Bijou as a wholesale sales specialist. Anna, we are so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Me, me too, baby. I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> Will you tell us a little bit about your journey? Um, so yeah, I'm a recent graduate. I graduated just two years ago um, as a fashion business program here. Uh, and since then, I've been working a lot of marketing and communications for various brands. But recently, I've joined um, Gaz Bijou. It's a French accessories brand. And I've tried to something new, such as wholesale, which is a new experience for me. But uh, I like it a lot. It's nice to work with clients directly. It's like, nice to do sales. Um, and we'll see, for now, I'm, I've decided to stay with them for a little longer, and I realized mm -hmm. that a world of accessories is something that I really enjoy and would like to know a little bit more, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we are introducing Tio Drenik. Hi, Tio. Hi, guys. Uh, 
Thanks for being here. He has been graduated from ESMOD uh, in the class of 2017 in the menswear specialization. And you have worked as uh, visual merchandising, uh, working in the buying and sales areas, uh, and also as a consulting. So uh, please let us know your journey since uh, leaving us at uh, your school. <laughs> Absolutely. I've um, graduated from Esmo de Roubaix, as well as uh, Ines over there. Yeah. And I was <laughs> in uh, fashion design in men's specialization. Uh, right after this, I uh, started my career in visual merchandising for Zara, which is like kind of a big company for this side. And then uh, quickly moved to Los Angeles to start my own uh, retail store, and as long as my uh, showroom. Um, it took place like for like three years and uh, on the side I was also a consultant for uh, multiple brands uh, in sales as well such as Mugler or Enfant de Primaire and stuff like this and recently I've just like launched my own showroom so I did fashion design but all my experiences are mostly like on the business side but yep that's it well that's great thank you Thank you, Theo. Thanks for joining us à distance. Um, we have another alum joining us uh, also online à distance, come on, <laughs> as we like to say in French. Uh, Francesco Del Barda, who graduated from uh, Esmed Fashion Design in 2016, also specializing in menswear, uh, and who works still today in the industry as a menswear designer. Um, hello, Francesco. Thanks for joining us. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your career path thus far? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yes, so. I'm originally from Italy and I moved to Paris to study in ESMOD and graduated, as she said, in 2016. And soon after that, I started my career path in Galerie Lafayette as an assistant designer to then move back to Italy to work for Brunello Cucinelli, that is a very big um, luxury house in Italy, uh, concentrating mostly on cashmere. Yeah. There, I, I did bespoke catering, so made to measure jackets, pants, coats, all these kind of things, to then move back to design uh, for Seven for All Mankind, an American brand that has their headquarters in Switzerland, which is where I am right now, working for them. Great, thank you so much, Francesco. We're looking to, forward to hearing more about all of the experience of the panelists that we have with us today um, for this round table on career paths in the fashion and luxury industries. Um, but first, we do have one other uh, person joining us, a colleague of Paulina and mine, uh, Jean-Charles uh, Lecer, who um, was once a professor, but is now the head of our academic uh, curriculum coordination department here at ESMUD Paris. Hello, Jean-Charles. Um, could you please uh, give us a little bit of an overview of the types of uh, career paths that are open to students once they graduate with either a fashion design or a fashion business degree from us here at SMUD? Thanks, Janana. Hi, guys. Nice to meet you. Our fashion design and fashion business training courses cover all jobs position of the fashion industry, from the birth of the garment to its distribution from design to marketing, from the ID to the sale, through uh, sourcing, strategy, manufacturing, and promotion, from craftsmanship to digital. Now let's have a quick overview who, on who makes your clothes. The t-shirt, the sweater, the dress you wear today has been designed for you by a fashion designer. It shapes what's created for you by a pattern maker. And what about the fabrics? It's a textile designer and the manufacturing a product developer. The price has been calculated by a product manager. And after that, the brand sells it to a store or online by a sale agent or head of sales. Your t-shirt was displayed in a storefront window by a visual merchandiser. At the same time, the marketing, the marketing team works on a digital and physical strategy to promote the product. I am inviting you to watch our last one table about the job position on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Jean-Charles. 
for that introduction on the uh, all of the basic um, the careers that are open to uh, anyone who graduates as a fashion designer, fashion business. And now let's turn to the first main topic of our roundtable today, which is CSR or corporate social responsibility. Um, so corporate social responsibility goes hand in hand with the evolution in business models that we are seeing today in an effort to minimize the negative impact uh, on the earth um, and also um, any social ethical issues, um, how companies treat their workforces, for example, inclusivity, diversity, all of this is encompassed in uh, this very big, uh, broad term. Um, so I will now give the floor to our panelists and have them speak on their experience uh, in regards to this topic. Um, and so first, uh, let's go to Itsuko. Um, in your position, can you tell us what the place of CSR as you've seen it um, with the people that you've uh, been in contact with and helped um, recruit? Um, yes. So. Today, CSR is everywhere. Um, we, we speak a lot about en the environment today, uh, but I would say that in fashion for a long time, because it was in an industry where people were passionate, uh, the labor conditions were very poor for a long time, to be honest. And uh, for the past, I would say six to seven years, the caring culture is becoming something very key. And um, most, Big groups, large groups are really uh, serious about it and they are offering training sessions for everyone so that people learn to understand how others feel and also because um, they, the, they wear a gap sometimes between the business side and the creative side within a company. They are all learning to work together with more empathy and this is something which is um, very good for you, for the student when you will join us, it will be a much better uh, labor uh, industry for you. And uh, not to mention that it is today a two trillion dollar industry fashion and it is expected to grow at, let's say three trillions in uh, 2030. It also means that um, its environmental impact is huge, and so companies are very, very, very serious about it as well. So they would expect from you students to have a social engagement very early uh, in your development and as a person. So uh, I really encourage you to start looking around you, how you can help people, and so that uh, you can really express your values and uh, your way to um, relate with others. I think that's uh, what you said is absolutely true. I think uh, a lot of people, as we know, the fashion industry is an incredibly pollutant industry. Uh, and so it is our job at ESMAD as, uh, as we are educating the next generation in fashion to make sure that they are thinking about these things, to make sure that they are thinking about the impact that they have on the environment, the ethical impact, making sure that their workforce is being treated correctly. Um, so thank you very much for that. Okay, and uh, Francesco, in this topic, I would like to ask you, as you work in the design area, especially in a, um, in a company that uh, is in the denim industry, which is one of the most demonized industries when it comes to environmental practices. How do you um, approach this personally, and how is it in uh, your company, the, how you approach and manage the issues of sustainability and, uh, um, you know, impact in the environment? It is true, the denim industry is one of the most impactful. So, um, it would be lying to say that uh, denim is a super sustainable product, but a lot has been made um, concerning the, the fabrics that are created and especially the, the treatment that the fabrics go through. Because denim, um, as some people may know, some other may not, um, is one of the most treated. So like all the washes that we do uh, on denim to have that like lighter shade or darker shade, all the uh, different kind of like reparation that we have is the most um, impactful on the environment of the treatments that we have. So um, we've been trying for a couple of years now to reduce, especially the use of water, because this is the, one of the main issue. 
um, and also the chemicals. So there's a lot of chemicals and water use. And we've been going through many different trials to make it less, uh, to use less water, use less chemicals. And that, that can be made with laser, that can be made with mineral dyes that don't need to use all of this and don't need to have chemicals to fix the product on the, um, this is part of like the design process already. We, we discussed with uh, the fabric manager that we have in our company, who has a lot of experience in the, in the industry, especially in the denim industry. So it is something that we take into consideration already from the very beginning, because it's not just something that we can avoid talking about. It's part of the product, but we're trying day by day to, to use less and less um, chemicals and less and less like um, techniques that would be much hurtful now that we know that there are so many other ways to get to a certain level of look. So it is really the, be the very beginning of the process already. We take into consideration that too. Well, that's great and to hear. That's great to hear, especially when you see that, you know, the, the, these issues are uh, part, an intrinsic part of their strategy and the way that you approach from the beginning, from the design, the, the fabrics, the processes that you are implementing. Thanks, uh, Francesco. Well, plus, I think it's really interesting that it adds a, a, a different level of creativity as well, because yeah. as, as you mentioned, totally. Francesco, you're having to experiment and see what works uh, and see what's feasible as well. So it adds a whole dimension uh, for you and for your creativity and those that you work with uh, to try to figure out uh, and sort of maneuver it, because you are pioneers in this, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> since we're, uh, we're catching up. Uh, so thanks. Yeah, totally agree on that. Uh, and now, Theo, uh, in this subject of social responsibility, I mean, it's not only environmental social responsibility, that's the, one of the biggest issues for sure, but it also involves other aspects like, for instance, uh, diversity, uh, how we uh, add other visions, how we uh, are more inclusive in terms of the, the people we work with or the clients or we are approaching. So in your perspective, having you know, the, the background of uh, design as well as more commercial and consulting different brands, how you have seen this? How it's uh, your experience with different brands? For me, um, I would say that the biggest change that I've seen, for example, for, as a consultant was at Mugler. Um, I worked for Mugler for now like a couple of years and they're just um, the leader in terms of inclusivity and it regroups like the gender, it regroups the ethnicity of the models that they're working with. Um, it just gives um, light on minorities sometimes that weren't there in the fashion industry. So I think that right now, um, it's in 2021, we really have to like highlight all types of communities and yeah. So I feel like there's a lot of changes right now in a lot of um, designers' perspectives and everything, and I think that's good that we are moving towards this kind of change uh, because we need it to uh, in terms of like even like body shapes and yeah, like body positivity positivity in general. And um, so yeah, I think that this has to be part of each and every companies in the fashion industry, but not just the fashion industry, the industry in general. So, and I think we are moving towards this. So it's interesting and we're looking forward to see what's going on in like the next 10 years. So, yeah. That's really cool. Uh, and especially I think that's um, uh, an issue, a topic that uh, future managers uh, have to consider as well. You know, so those, especially those coming into the fashion business area, that's a hot topic. How you treat your people, how you address to a more diverse uh, uh, groups of people with different visions that are like yours, how you communicate properly. We have seen examples of brands doing very wrong communications for specific markets, so it's something that is very uh, actual and current. Thank you. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Teo. And it's true, we, we you know, we have uh, classes in, at the Fashion Business School on how to be a good manager, and that is part of it, of course. Yeah. Um, so uh, very interesting, and I agree. I am interested to see how things develop over the next uh, over the next few years in that area, for sure. Um, so now let's shift gears again slightly uh, and go to Inez, um, who sees uh, sort of a different side of things, um, being uh, in your French brand, uh, ACP, being in CRM, which is uh, Customer Relations Management. Um, so you have to keep a close eye on the clients uh, of your company. Um, so tell us about any shifts that you've seen in your role because of uh, CSR and the sort of um, aspects that that encompasses. Mm, it's like the CSR, it's very important today. Uh, but it's different, it depends on the brand. So before in my other brand, it's really something a little like bullshit. So we communicate many about that, but in fact, uh, the fabrics are bad or not conscientious. But today in APC, it's different because uh, it's not really conscientious like Marine Serre or other brands who are really on the upside clean, etc. It's more like a little fact today. So for example, to, um, to launch uh, an offer whose name IPC Vintage. It's like um, second life for the product, for example. Um, in the few days, uh, the program will be launched. Uh, and to quotidianly, for example, at the health quarter, um, some, some many people work on it today, every day, sorry. And, uh, but the brand don't communicate about that. And I found that great because it's not something we like to, to talk about everyone. So, oh, this brand is great, you do that, etc. It's really personal and it's better to do that than communicate about that and do nothing in fact. So I respect about that to do that internal uh, between people who, who are in this leash and, and that's it. <laughs> Um, and in terms of, uh, because in, in your role, you have to sort of look at uh, the customers um, of your brand and find ways to make sure that A, that they stay customers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that also sort of listen to what it is that they want. That way the brand uh, maintains them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so are you feeling uh, any pushback from, from the customers of, uh, of ACP? Are they looking for this? Uh, I don't really have uh, feedback about customer because uh, I'm in HQ, so it's more about the, the boutique, the POS, the point of sales. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important for your client, and it's for that who launch many programs about that, and we continue to work on it. Great, thank you so much. Um, and now we will go to uh, Anna. Uh, in your role, you also see a different side of things, being on the wholesale and on the sales side. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how your role and sort of your venue has been impacted by, uh, by CSR? Um, so at GAS, what I really like is that um, we have our own atelier. So we produce things and, you know, it's very, it's a craftsmanship. So it's definitely already, you know, we're stepping away a little bit from mass market and we're not overproducing and we make sure that we, like, we're exclusive. Um, but at the same time, I have just joined them. So, and it's been a little bit of a, you know, a little break for them since the COVID and it's a little complicated, but um, now we see that we we have returns on clients and sales and everything, and um, it's getting bigger and bigger, which is great, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we remain, you know, conscious that we take care of things. And what I do notice when I really appreciate is that more and more that we work with clients, we now offer them, for example, to make orders on stock. So we don't in particular send them our catalogs and ask them, hey, you can choose, you know, thousands of quantities we really tell them we have this stock available or if you guys want we can make this but we're going to make it very you know unique amount of numbers we're not going to overdo it so I guess we're not working with materials we work with metals but it's just you know just as important to to stay conscious in that um, and uh, yeah I believe that uh, having an atelier being more on the craftsmanship side and being more on a stock sales really helps for jewelry brands jewelry sector to remain in that sector you know to take care to be conscious mm. Before you were at uh, Gaz Bijou, you did more uh, things within the uh, communications and marketing venue, right? Um, so can you tell me a little bit about sort of your impressions, uh, same way that Inez, um, you know, she's in contact with the client, so she must have, you know, you must have an idea of what it is that they're sort of looking for and where they want all the brands to go as well. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, so I've worked for smaller but international brands. Um, 
and pretty much had to work with a lot of international clients. And definitely that helped to see how, you know, from different countries, people look at different things. Um, and I would say that since the first year, pretty much that I started working in France, I would always see that clients are interested in a more conscious approach. And there are, of course, a few cases when, you know, they just don't really care, but we can go without them. But um, they always, for example, when we were due, and uh, for the, before guys, I worked for the event and um, agency, and we would always have to, you know, do invitations and whatnot, organize events, and that would also always require, even for smaller things such as invitations, it would always require paper, you know, and whatnot. And I would see that pretty much not even one client would say yes to that. Everyone would ask to make it digital, to make it as less um, like um, environment related as possible. So that was nice. Even in terms of events, it would be always. Um, guys, let's do more of a, I don't know, um, digital installations rather than let's buy things, let's overdo things, let's, you know. So it's smaller things, um, but both in, in event business and in fashion business, um, definitely packaging, you know, invitations, events, is getting bigger and bigger in terms of uh, conscious approach, and that's that's very, really cool. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. Um, for everyone that is watching online, uh, I just want to remind you all that we will be, of course, uh, doing a question and answer session after uh, we've finished our roundtable discussion. So whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, feel free to add your questions in the comments, and we will answer them at the very end. Uh, I would like to add, just before you know, finishing this topic of CSR, that uh, um, we work in the admission service, and so we review uh, applications all the time. And I would say easily nine out of ten applications, they're always, you know, uh, something related to social responsibility. Either it's inclusivity, gender, uh, bias, uh, or uh, obviously, you know, the environment. So it's something very, very current. And this is great to see that the future, you know, uh, managers w coming here, they already have that kind of reflex. Uh, when approaching uh, uh, the formation they would like to pursue. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. Anna, you mentioned uh, the, the shift uh, towards digital tools and everything, which is perfect because that is our next topic. Exactly. Um, so technology has disrupted everything. And in this industry in particular, uh, it is present since the very beginning, since the conception of an idea, the prototypes, uh, the materials that we're looking for, uh, up to the way that we uh, produce something and how we communicate that we are here, our brands, how we connect with uh, uh, consumers or how we approach new markets. Uh, and at ESMOD, this is also, the digitalization is also part of what we uh, present to our students. Whereas in the fashion design program, as well as in the fashion business programs, it's something that is intrinsically in. You will be practicing and learning how to manage how to learn new tools, how to be digital natives. Well, most of you are ready, so that's great, <laughs> actually. Good start. <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, in this way, uh, Itsuko, I would like to ask you uh, from your perspective as a recruiter, how is, I mean, how much has changed the, you know, the, the, the job profiles that you're looking for, for for the fashion industry? And what are the some of the core skills in digital that uh, brands or companies are looking for? Maybe sell, depending on the area, I understand, but if you can take, talk, talk us uh, a little bit more about that. Yes, uh, thank you. So um, digital is quite uh, very related to CSR as well, uh, like Anna said. And um, obviously large companies had more uh, money <coughs> to uh, pour into and developing uh, new tools. So, uh, for instance, Tommy Hilfiger has uh, developed a whole um, tool to have merchandiser and uh, prototypers and pattern makers and started working together all in one tool and not just sequencing. And which means that you are, you really, it really allows everyone to um, work together, whereas in the traditional way, you had everyone working on his specific contributions along a timeline, and it could take quite long. And today, for prototyping, for example, at Decathlon, they would work all together with the Oculus uh, mask and trying things together with engineers, and which means that um, depending on the size of the company you will join, 
um, you will have access to uh, new tools. Today we have very um, instrumental tools for small companies as well. Now the uh, entrance fee, would say, or entry price is uh, much lower, so I uh, bet that by the time the forthcoming uh, the new students uh, will be joining the, the market, um, it will be uh, very open, and which also means that um, in the fashion industry, you will need to be keen to learn all these new tools. So uh, this is something um, recruiters will see, uh, check whether you are curious about things, uh, what kind of digital media you have been through, uh, whether you are very, very uh, curious about what people like, what games are, are working also, and trying learning and um, and um, not becoming an expert, I would say, uh, but you can you can be a gaming expert. For instance, today we uh, speak a lot of about metaverse. At Gucci, they set up uh, a team, or at least yes, a team about four to five years ago within Gucci to um, to work and study what would be uh, the opportunities for uh, Gucci with the gaming industry and the gaming tools, so which mean that um, everything everything is possible, I would say, in fashion, and which is quite fun, but, and very exciting. And uh, if we speak, well, and for merchandising, uh, which I, I guess that Theo would uh, speak more about it, but they are specific too as well, that can change his work. And some of them really, uh, helps to um, produce less waste, uh, to uh, shorten the uh, prototyping cycle, and uh, which is quite uh, great, and also to have more manufacturing um, factories, which means that there will be less um, transport. Uh, between right. markets, because today most of the brands have uh, sell globally. I'm sorry, so I was a bit lengthy. Maybe. <laughs> that's okay. That's that's t that's great. You got a, a great uh, overview, and it's very true that uh, it's really important that, uh, of course, uh, as we um, have these digital tools uh, disposable to us, that we use them, uh, and that's why at Esmed, as Paulina mentioned, we uh, really try to stay in phase with the industry, as in as in many things, uh, but specifically for the digital tools, because we know that uh, you know things like Clo 3D, for example, uh, Modaris Lectra 3D, um, these are are going to be absolutely um, crucial for the fashion industry going forward. And so uh, we at SMED, we were the first school to teach Clo 3D uh, because it's really important for our students once they graduate and they are being recruited by people like Itsuko, um, that they have these tools at their disposal to put on their resume and that uh, it's an added bonus for them and they can hit the ground running um, with these skills and even maybe teach the people that, uh, that already work in their companies um, how to use them as well. Um, so thank you so much, Itsuko. Um, we will um, now speak uh, to Anna. Um, you already mentioned a little bit uh, about how digital has affected uh, sort of your your past jobs in uh, in the marketing slash communications event planning uh, arena. Can you talk a little bit about the digital tools that uh, are maybe shifting things for uh, for the wholesale sales uh, part as well? Um, well, <laughs> I guess Gatsby is a very you know like old school French brand. Uh, so it's a little a little bit more complicated, I guess, in terms of that. But, um, you know, now the COVID, I believe, would influence a lot of digitalization at Gaz. Um, for all our clients, it's always... It's really, it's really digital. So our marketing team uh, is doing a great job right now. We really are trying to change so much because... Uh, you know, it's all the all the brands working from omnichannel and going to multi-channels, and this is something we're trying to really improve now because, as I said, you know, we exist since 1960s, so we're like very old, classic, uh, vintage French brand, and this is not something common, as we all know, within French industry to French French brands to be, you know, all over internet, all over digital. Uh, but we understand that we have to keep up, and um, you know, it's also in terms of transparency, which is um, which comes along with digitalization, we want to make sure that our our clients they trust us they you know our brands that we work with they can make sales knowing that they are not gonna harm anyone or anything you know and um 
This is definitely nice to see how an old brand is trying to involve into this new world, new environment, and really push. Uh, at the same time, to you know, to stay classic, to stay not over the top. Um, so definitely, um, definitely <laughs> well, a lot of smaller things, but they go along together. But, but one thing about that, being old doesn't mean that you are, you, you are not able to learn. I mean, we are an old school, 180 years old, That's and right. we have digital and tools. And even this old dog can learn new tricks, right? <laughs> exactly. Definitely. So uh, it's possible, believe me. <laughs> Definitely, that Esmond, you know, was the first place where I learned a lot about things such as omnichannel, multi-channel, you know. So great. Esmond is doing a great job, and um, it's really, really great that students coming from here, we all learn these things, and then once we go to the to the agencies and we work with, with brands, we can we can talk, we can share, and that's what I've been trying to do within my work experience. You know, I've tried to share and like to maybe help a little bit the brands to speak on on this matter. But so it's it's really really cool. Yeah. It's really important. <laughs> you have to be the catalyst for change, especially in those scenarios like uh, more like traditional conservative maybe companies or visions. Uh, we that's great that you have the the tools and the energy to be to to start change to push yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely definitely and i think it's also important that like as you mentioned that even though it's an old brand they are trying to you know keep up with the times and it's important also for these old older brands or people that are not necessarily willing to admit that uh, you know the digital tools are here and that they need to use them um, because while you you know you don't want as a company to lose the dna of your brand these digital tools are actually helping um, they can make things easier they can you know, facilitate communication either between uh, employees within the company or between the company and their customer. Uh, so, you know, these these tools are here to help. I think that's the the key uh, the key thing to keep in mind. Yeah, that's true for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, and now, uh, in this topic, Anna, um, Ines, I'm sorry. I would <laughs> like to know your experience because you have worked also for. Uh, digital uh, companies. Uh, now you work in uh, CRM, so I guess a lot of data and information yeah. where technology can help yeah, to really. navigate much easier. So tell us about it. About that, uh, as say, I know before the COVID has changed many things about that. Uh, my principal mis mission today, topic, it's to work about the omnicanality, about how to do the same program in retail than uh, in uh, in the e-shop. So that is very important for us to, for your customer, uh, to to have a loyalty uh, on the web and the same uh, on the retail. So uh, today it's very important for the brand to work about that. And I think it's the first topic on my on my work. It's to really omnicanality the the, the world uh, the world sorry of IPC. Um, so for that it's very important. And about the digitalization, uh, yes, the CRM uh, part very important on that because uh, we work many on database, on client database. So we need to, to filter client. This client buy more menswear, this client more mainly dress, I don't know, whatever. Uh, so the digitalization has a part very important on CRM and customer experience. Right. And uh, it's a part very important about this job. Uh, I like for that, and <laughs> many Excel too. Uh, and it's right with the COVID, uh, your marketing part is very changed. But that's cool because uh, we have invested in many time with that. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you so much. It is really interesting because, uh, you know, obviously the digital tools that you for your role would need are different from that that Anna would need are different from that that uh, that Teo would need as well. <laughs> Speaking <Yeah>. of, <laughs> Teo, <laughs> um, could you uh, tell us a little bit about um, how you have uh, used digital tools, any shifts that you've seen in, in that as uh, they have been uh, added more and more to the market? For sure. Yeah. Uh, for me, um, my job was all about meeting people physically. I mean, I had to meet buyers from stores all around the world to present them the collection um, that they might buy for their store. So when COVID happens, like we were just, OK, so now what are we going to do? And everything has changed from like it just like I think speed up the process of the digitalization uh, when it comes when it comes to like um, presenting the collection like we used to do shows like runway shows with physical people now they had to move to like videos and like shooting movies to present the collection so 
I think it opens like a little bit more the creativity for designers. So that's good as well. And then like for me as a, in the wholesale part, um, we had to move everything digitally and present everything through Zoom or like any other platform. And I think that the, um, a lot of like uh, companies um, developed like software that works really well to present the collection to buyers digitally, such as Jor or like Le New Black in France. Um, and so, yeah, so we, the digitalization for us has, it's really important for us. Like we, without this, like right now, I won't have a job, I think like because of COVID. So that's good. That's good. <laughs> well, uh, thanks uh, Tio for that. You were speaking f mostly from your commercial business side uh, and how digitalization has impacted you. Uh, and Francesco, since you are in the early stage of this story in the designing and the creative aspect. Um, how is it, how you, I guess that you work with digital tools as well, but if you can share with us a little bit more how it has impacted your, the way that you do your job currently. I feel like um, what has impacted the most is more of um, the product development uh, pro process. Um, as in, we have to translate the designs into real products. And as everyone was saying, especially uh, with COVID, um, a big part of the development of these products was visiting factories, uh, suppliers, all these um, places and people that we couldn't see face to face. So a lot of platforms had to be put in place so that we could still follow the life cycle of the product and see from our ideas to the finished one how we could like make changes or like see what information was missing so like the communication that Isuko was also talking about between the different departments so I feel like the most impactful um, that the digitalization has been is in the product development because of course we needed to follow all of these Um, from pattern from to design to print or anything that really had to be uh, discussed and that couldn't have been done face to face anymore. Thank you for your insights, Francesco. That's really interesting. Um, I think, uh, as Teo mentioned, it was sort of not because of COVID necessarily, but uh, with the with the arrival of COVID and the pandemic, uh, I think a lot of people were sort of forced into using the digital tools that we had at our disposal just to keep life going. <laughs> um, yes. And uh, I think now they're they're so much a part of what we do that it's hard to separate the two and. That's great because, uh, as uh, as we mentioned, uh, there are certain tools that can help lower the environmental impact to help uh, boost communication, as Francesco mentioned. Um, and so all of this is really with the goal of being more productive, um, not only for the company, but as a society as well, which I think is really important. Uh, and I think that also the key insight that we can uh, say about this is... Uh, Today, digitalization is not a choice, it's a must. Yes. Irrespective of the field that you're working, irrespective of the function, uh, and irrespective of the in which stage of this uh, process, fashion process, let's say, from conception up to post-sales, it's there somehow. Uh, so better get open and curious, as you say, Itsuka. I think that's also a key to address those, uh, to be open to learn, because it will be changing, that's for sure, you know. Uh, and use it and integrate it on your own, you know, skill set. That's, I think, is essential. Absolutely. I mean, I can. I, mean, I think we can agree with Theo that using Zoom and Jour every day is also not that bad. So yeah. <laughs> it's working pretty well. <laughs> well done. Cool. Good that's to the know. trade off, right? <laughs> Keep working, not use Zoom. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so we will now uh, go back to Jean-Charles online, and he will tell us uh, a little bit about our third and final theme of the day, entrepreneurship. Yes, thank you, Jenna. Uh, yes, it's interesting to see uh, how the, the new uh, generation of uh, emerging designer is so young today, and, uh, and I think it's a, a really good thing. 
uh, our training courses open the way to a new generation of entrepreneurs uh, because they allow to have a 360 degrees vision of the fashion industry. And um, Theo, what do you think uh, of the interest of uh, the young professional uh, to create their own business? And maybe you have some advice. Um, yeah, so I'm working with a lot of uh, young designers um, from the first step to like the last step, which is like when the customers get the product on his hands. And so it's really interesting to like, so I will like, I advise them in terms of collection building and like, I don't know, like from their, um, try to take out from their mind, from their creative mind, um, the products that they want to put out on the market. So it's really, really interesting for me to like follow all the creative process and then move on to the production and the sales. So um, I don't know, like, and as far as like advice for like um, young designers that would like to like launch this brand, I would say like, as long as you're passionate about what you do, because the fashion industry is like all about passion like you have to be like motivated to do it because it's a job that it's yeah it's it's a job that takes like um, a lot of work to like do it well so as long as you're passionate about what you're doing you can do whatever so so yeah i would say like the passion about the um, the, the the job would be the first uh, advice for me thank you Theo. Thank you, Théo, and thank you, Jean-Charles. Um, Itsuko, um, do you have, in your experience, obviously, uh, as a recruiter, um, you may not necessarily have people in front of you that are wanting to <laughs> launch uh, their brand or be entrepreneurs, but um, you may have uh, come into contact with people uh, who have tried and then decided against it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, Entrepreneurship is very tempting where you are very talented. And um, to be successful, what is really key is to build your network. And building your network at this mode um, in this kind of environment is very, very, very important because you cannot do everything by yourself, even if you are very talented. So either you are more on the business side or more on the creative side or a mix of the two. But it's really good to have some people, uh, business partners to rely upon, but also also friends who will be um, who will give you to sincere feedback uh, which will be very important for you and to give you an example uh, a lot of uh, successful entrepreneurs keep also a bond with uh, larger companies either about um, collaborating on a freelance basis and so on because it's another way of working and today, as you can see, big, large groups are all inviting external designers um, for collaboration because right. it is really uh, providing uh, momentum and also, um, how do you say, passion also in it. Mm. And also, if I can give you a great example of friendship and part business partnership is that uh, Kim Jones has met uh, among his um, comrades at a fashion school someone who helped him building his business at the very uh, start of his uh, own brand. And then he decided to join um, Dan Hill at Richmond Group and so on. Then he went to Louis Vuitton and now he's at your home. And today he invited his former business partner who is today working for Sakai to do a collaboration today. It is all over the world today. So um, you can build very interesting path on a 20, 30, 40 year uh, career. And which is really important. And so for that, you have to build genuine relationship and share uh, your passion about clothing, but also culture, music. We can see that Virgil Abloh has uh, yeah. built his relationship around music, and then he uh, ventures into fashion. So uh, be true to yourself, but also open to others. That will help you to, to build your brand and your universe. If I may add also something about entrepreneurship from the admissions perspective. Again, uh, and maybe you, Yan Shah, will agree with me. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> when reviewing applications, especially first year, easily more than half, they're all 
express either their willingness to have their own brand in the future, or some of them, they already have experience uh, uh, with, a, let's say, a vintage business like upcycling, or they have a, a small jewelry you know, uh, uh, experiences, you know, creating something and selling online. Uh, so it's something very interesting, both in the fashion design and fashion business field, to see that they already have that kind of uh, idea, that kind of reflex in, on, on, in their own, you know? And, uh, and that's something that I think in terms of fashion, it's also related to curiosity and energy. And that's really great to have since the very beginning and use it throughout the, the, the programs. Absolutely. And I think uh, it's, um, it's really important, as you said, to build, uh, to build a network and to have support, yeah. whether or not you want to be your own boss, uh, no matter what you do <laughs> in the fashion industry or otherwise, it's really important to build a network. And I, I think one of the great things uh, about ESMUD is, uh, as we can see today, based on our, uh, our lovely alums that have joined us, um, there's no better network than the S1 network. There are alums uh, in positions in brands uh, all around the world um, in different functions and different roles. Um, and so that's a great place to start um, when you're uh, fresh out of, uh, out of your program. When you've just graduated, you already have a whole network of alums that A, have shared your experience uh, with the ESMUD curriculum and being uh, an ESMUD yen. Um, <laughs> and then also, uh, you know, the more, the more experience you gain, the more contacts you'll gain as well, and your network will grow and grow. And as most students start early on that in terms of the networking, because you have, it, depending on the program, you have mandatory internships. And I think that's a, also a great way to build your network, start learning, start practicing what you are what you have been told, you know, in the programs. Um, so you start early, much better, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Itsuko, and to also our alums uh, for your super interesting uh, experiences uh, and for sharing them with us. Um, so we, we discussed uh, a few different topics on uh, career paths in the fashion industry, including CSR, corporate social responsibility, the digital revolution, and the tools that have come along with it, and lastly, entrepreneurship. Um, I think we, uh, we definitely learned a lot about all of you and about your experiences, and we thank you for that. Um, and we will now go to the audience. Um, so for those of you watching at home on Facebook and on YouTube, um, if you have any questions, now's your chance. Now's the time. Um, you can ask either uh, our panelists, our alums, uh, either online or that we have here in person. Or if you have any questions uh, about ESMUD itself, about the admissions process, about our school or our programs, um, now's the time. Do we have any questions online? We'll see. <laughs> Why don't we start with one question that I will ask Paulina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it is one of our uh, most frequently asked questions, I would say. Um, <laughs> what is the application process? Uh, okay, application process, it's uh, very simple. Uh, it has three, four steps, if we can uh, summarize. First of all, you have to create your online account at uh, our space. Uh, my.esmod.com. You will be filling your personal information there and uploading the documents that you need to uh, apply for a specific program. In general, a copy of your ID, uh, a copy of your CV, um, your motivation letter, and a copy of your latest uh, diploma or transcripts. Uh, when you, once you fill that and send your application online, we will be reviewing internally at uh, Esmod. And uh, if you, that's complete and the, per, the profile is eligible for the formation uh, chosen, we move into the second step, which is we will send you a simple exercise uh, or assignment to prepare. It will be a different assignment, obviously, but, uh, if it's a fashion design program or a fashion business, but still something very easy, nothing to be worried about. What we would like to see is your creativity, your inspirations, your personal universe, to know you better in, uh, in this uh, aspect, more closer to design or business. Once we receive that, we move into the third uh, step of the process, which is uh, an interview with a faculty member. So uh, in this interview, again, is 
the idea and the goal is to know you better, to see who you are, what you can bring into the table, um, why you have chosen us, this particular uh, program, uh, why the fashion industry, and so on. Uh, there are no right or wrong answers. Just be yourself. Don't worry about what we think. Show us who you are, because that's the only thing that we are uh, looking for. Uh, and it's up to you what kind of information and how you present yourself to us. Uh, because it's you, it's your application, not ours. <laughs> uh, and once we finish, uh, once you pass the interview, we will issue the, the final response. Uh, as as Teo mentioned earlier, the fashion industry is one uh, that is built on passion. Uh, and so yeah. for us, when we read, when we look at applications, the most important thing is to see that passion, is to see that you you like fashion, that you love it, um, and that uh, that you're really motivated to to study it. Because once you're here at SMED, whether it's fashion design or fashion business, it is fashion 24-7. And so we want to make sure that once you get here, after two weeks, after three months, after a year, you're not uh, over. It. We want to make sure that this is really yeah. the one for you. And so yeah. uh, that's the most important thing for us when we look at your applications. Exactly. And the thing is that, uh, as we also mentioned it throughout the, 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 the discussion before, be curious, be open to learn. That's very important because this is a creative industry, irrespective of the, the, the design you are, design or fashion. And, and you have to be uh, able to learn and to be open to try new things and explore. That's the key aspect of uh, this industry. So you have to keep up on that and being uh, aware and being able to learn and, and, and grow. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, one question now that will be addressed to uh, the alums that are here with us today. Um, do you have any advice for, any, uh, for anyone who is looking to start their career in the fashion industry? Why don't we start first with Anna? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think coming from me, I'm from, you know, from Belarusian, from a small country coming to France, uh, joining the fashion business school. Um, an advice would be, do not be scared. It's going to be great because um, you're going to meet so many international people. You're going to have a chance to work exactly, you know, in, in ASMA, uh, internships are a must, of a, like a part of the program. And that just pushes you to, to work, to, to see more people, to, you know, understand what France is like, how it works, etc. But at the same time, um, here at this specific school, the everyone, like the professors, the, the students, pretty much everyone who comes into the school all have an idea, all have the desire, have passion in some way or another around the fashion sector, whether it's design or whether it's business. And even if you, for example, when I came, you know, I had one perspective in my mind, I had something going on in my head, but then starting to to talk to people, to meet more people, you really, you, you develop, you grow. And it's really, really nice. And the more projects you do, the more internships you work at, um, it just teaches you a lot. So apply, be be who you are and try to push it. And, you know, as we talked about entrepreneurship also before, for me, I'm not quite there yet. I've decided, yeah. to, you know, to just kind of learn different sectors before starting something of my own. Um, but I, the one thing I strongly, strongly believe in and I think um, I would you know, recommend for, for the future students of ASMOD or just people joining fashion industries that have this strong vision and just go for it because it's such a competitive environment and it's such a creative environment and everyone here has an opinion, has something to prove and to show. And this is just up to you to be that person who chose this or that um, object and pushes for it no matter what. So <laughs> that would be... <laughs> I like what you said about not being scared for coming here. Uh, yeah. and, and this is a, a special mes message for international students. Absolutely. Um, it's great to come here. You will be learn a lot. You will, will be also uh, gaining the savoir faire, yeah. uh, the French savoir faire. Uh, but you will also add something to us in terms of you know, your own experiences, your own background, your own, uh, your own uh, ideas. And it might be tough sometimes, maybe you have uh, probably some tough, rough moments, but that's okay. You know, the, the, the goal is go through it. You know, it, you, it will all, only helps you to 
get stronger, gets better, uh, being more sure what, what you like or what you don't like. Uh, and it's totally feasible. It's a process. Uh, so don't get scared. Don't think that because you have one downsize or one bad experience, uh, whatever it is, that's over. No, keep pushing it because that's it. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Inez, can you give us any advice that you would uh, have for prospective students? Yeah, I agree with Anna. And two, you need to be determined because uh, there are many people who would like to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to, to have who you are because it's your personality who determine who you are between other people, for example. Uh, and I think the patient is very important too. You need to be into our passionate about the, the government in general. And, and study in, in Paris, it's a great city. You have many things to do. And for the fashion, it's uh, the spot. Mm -hmm. and, and don't scare, it's right. Uh, come here and uh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Inez. Uh, let's go online. Uh, Francesco, can, can you give us any advice that you would have for uh, some prospective students that are interested in, uh, in getting their career started in the fashion industry? I would probably go along very similarly with what has been said. I would say just uh, be curious and be open. Curious and open to to learn, to to do different experiences, work experiences, things that maybe you wouldn't even um, imagine before. So like different sectors as well, and curious and open to learn and meet people. So like that you have this exchange because every experience really teaches you something that is part of what you will bring you to uh, your next step and then to maybe what is your goal. That's probably the advice. <laughs> That's beautiful advice. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and how about you, Teo? Do you have any advice for prospective students that want to break into the fashion industry? Also, like, it could be like um, a little bit scary to like um, decide if you want to do like fashion design or fashion business. Sometimes you don't really know where you want to go, like because it's just the start of your career. So my advice is coming from my point of view because this is what I experience is that I've did fashion design for three years, and the job that I'm doing now is more like on the business side. So don't be scared to like go within like one path or another one because at the end of the path like they just combine like you can always like i don't know like there's so many jobs in the fashion industry that like they're they're all connected so at one point like you you will find your spot even though like you did fashion design or fashion business whatever like it just like do whatever you want to do and go for it and yeah don't be scared I'm so glad that uh, you tell, uh, talk about that because uh, from the admissions perspective, again, it's our job to help you to define and guide you which area is you are more closer, at least for the start. Uh, so don't hesitate to contact us later on to request, you know, an uh, uh, online meeting or come in here if you're able because we are here to help and we have these discussions all the time, isn't it, Janan? Yes. So we can help you to, you know, to go through it and to say, okay, maybe I'm more to closer to one area rather, rather than the other. But again, uh, also what you said there about, you know, the, 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 the industry is so big that allows you uh, in the same, very same way that you grow to move forward. And probably that's something that you have seen uh, Itsuko uh, in recruiting, that people switching or moving from, starting from one background and moving much more to the other one uh, as well, isn't it? Oh. Yes, totally. Uh, you are completely free in <laughs> this industry because um, the key point is to be of course, passionate, but also open. And things are changing so fast that as soon as uh, you, you don't have so much lag, like if you have your fundamental that you will require either business or the design courses here, then as far as you are curious and able to learn, keen to learn, then you can adapt to new jobs. You can also create your own uh, jobs and expertise, which did not exist beforehand. So um, 
And um, also, for instance, uh, if you have, if today you're not completely sure, if your parents are not sure, and so on, just you, uh, what you can, you, you need to know that at ESMOD and in other fashion schools as well, there are master degrees for those who have done finance studies or legal studies or. Uh, a very generalist um, école de commerce, as we call it in France, or even engineer studies. Uh, I know very talented uh, CEOs who are uh, who have an engineering background, and yet they are CEOs of uh, fashion brands today. And but at some point they would need to to have uh, training either at this model or the fashion school to learn more learn more about the product and knowing right. the product at the very start of your um, professional career is very very helpful and um, the other way around and also at some point you can change and switch. I came from a legal background, went to fashion, but you can also start in fashion at some point. Uh, you would be offered to become uh, HR, for instance, within fashion, because you are good to find the right talent for the uh, right position. This is my this might not be uh, your dream today, but <laughs> people change also. Yes, people you never know. Change, and knowing the industry from inside can give you much a larger choice in 10 or 15 years. Um, so just do not hesitate. If today you want to uh, work in fashion, uh, do consider fashion schools. Thank you, Itsuko. Um, and I, I wanted to uh, go back to something that, that uh, Paulina mentioned uh, and also what Itsuko mentioned in terms of uh, fashion business uh, and sort of the, the largeness of it. I think the common misconception about fashion business is that it's not creative because obviously fashion design is very creative and therefore fashion business can't be. But that's not at all the case. Fashion business is still incredibly creative, just in a very different way. You're not uh, sewing a garment necessarily, but it's still incredibly creative. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Inez, uh, you had experience. You did uh, your undergraduate first in fashion design and then did your master's in fashion business. Can you talk a little bit about your experience going from one to the other? Yeah. Uh, uh, first, I joined the fashion design because uh, for me, for, at this moment, it was important to have notion about the fabrics. Uh, about how is uh, how is uh, the details uh, and important about the gunman and in second time after I learned about how to to sell something how to communicate about that and now it's very important for me to have both um, both uh, both uh, sorry <laughs> I both profiles yeah, both profile of course and um, and today it's um, maybe it's positive for me and I think it's the case um, because I have notion about how it's uh, how it's a uh, government and to how it's uh, to manage that and to work about other people about the marketing. So I think both it's better, but uh, as I said before, you can you can move on on one part and on the other one um, because uh, fashion is you can make every everything inside. So don't be scared about that because it's just uh, for beginning as I said Theo before. And uh, both are really great too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Inez. We have uh, another question from someone uh, watching at home. Uh, Teresa asked, uh, "How much time does one have to do an assignment? Uh, do the assignment after applying?" Paulina, how much time do they have um, to do their assignment? A good question. In general or overall, we will say it's like one week or so. Uh, once we send you the assignment to be to be prepared, uh, we can be a little bit flexible on that in in the sense that that maybe there is you know I don't know like a break in between holidays or whatever we can discuss that. But in general, it goes like one week, ten days tops, uh, because the idea is that you also deliver in a within a certain deadline. You know, we cannot give you, you know like all the time of the world because it's, you know, it's not uh, efficient. You know, not for uh, for you, not for us, not for uh, anyone. Uh, but it, in general, it goes that way. But again, don't be worried about the assignment. A, it's not difficult itself. Uh, it, B, it doesn't have to be perfect. And C. Uh, the the goal is show us who you are. Uh, if it is mo well done or not, that's another discussion, and we won't be grading you on that. The idea is knowing who you are. 
Yes. We're not trying to trick you. We're just trying to get to know you. <laughs> so there are no <laughs> wrong answers. <laughs> uh, we have another question from Teresa as well. Uh, is the English program taught entirely in English or also partly in French? Uh, so Teresa, um, there are two answers to that. I will answer for both the fashion business <laughs> and the fashion design side. Why not? Um, so on the fashion business side, the answer is yes. All uh, three years, all five years, actually, if you continue on to the master's, are offered in either French or English. English and are taught entirely in one or the other with, of course, your foreign language classes. So if you are in the English program, you will take French classes um, or vice versa. Uh, on the fashion design side, it's slightly more complicated. Um, we do have the uh, first and second year uh, in English with some French thrown in in your second year because uh, in the third year, uh, it is divided by specialization rather than by language. Here at Estimate Paris, we offer um, 11 different specializations uh, that you can choose in your third year. Uh, everything spanning from women's wear, uh, ready to wear, men's wear, ready to wear, uh, children's wear, lingerie, uh, sportswear and technique. Um, and so in order to give all of the students uh, all of the choices and specialization, that third year is taught in French. But by the time you get to your third year, you will have had enough French uh, and fashion vocabulary to, uh, to fully be able to understand that third year. Also keep in mind that uh, pretty much all of our professors also do speak uh, English. So even if you uh, have some issues, you need uh, some help, your professor is more than willing to help out. If I may add something about that also, about languages, um, for in order to apply to SMOD, you don't have to present uh, a language proficiency in test. It's not mandatory. If you have it, great. You can add it much better. Uh, because uh, especially when we talk about uh, first year applications, we use the uh, interview step as a way to assess directly in person or by online your language skills, either in French or in English. Uh, so uh, that's not something that you need from the start. But just be aware that it's much better to have it a certain uh, language test before or have certain proficiency, especially in French if you are coming from abroad, because that will make your life easier um, on a social uh, level or as well as an academic level. It helps for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can tell. <laughs> All right, we have another question that is going to be uh, again addressed to our alums here with us today. Um, the question is, can you tell us um, the one thing that you took away from your ESMA education? Um, so what was the most useful thing that you would say that you got out of your ESMA education, maybe that you use uh, in your professions today sort of on a regular basis? Uh, why don't we start uh, this time with Inez. Can you tell us uh, what is something that you learned while you were at ESMAD that has been really useful in your career? Oh, many things, but uh, <laughs> I think the principal thing is to, is to work on team because uh, especially in uh, fashion business, all projects as uh, with different people and you need to work about with people who are different of you and that is very great because after when you work for a company, you need to work about different departments and I think it's the first thing really important. <laughs> Thank you. How about you, Anna? Uh, I agree with Inez that definitely teamwork and learning how to work in the team is a great, great thing that Asma taught me personally because so many group projects, get ready guys, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a great thing. But also, uh, you know, since there's so many creative projects, it's just always pushes you to think outside the box. Um, and this is something that even when we thought, for example, I write in our thesis, you know, at one moment I was just like, there's there's absolutely nothing I can offer you because <laughs> it just seems like it's impossible, but but it is, there's always, there's always something else. And this is something I think that I took um, from my experience at asthma that just, you know, you just need to, you know, maybe take a little pause, breathe out, and then more ideas will come up, more solutions will come up to your head. And, it will eventually work out. Um, and whether it's a personal project, whether it's a group project, you know, working with international people, not in particular, sometimes maybe, you know, even being familiar with the culture, with how they look at things, with how they look, uh, know things. It's just, it's a really, really great skill that um, ESMA definitely helped to, to see and to develop. 
Thank you, Anna. Um, all right, let's go online. Let's talk to Teo first this time. Uh, Teo, can you tell us, is there anything um, that you've taken away from your ESMIN education that you use uh, all the time in your career? Respect deadline. That was something that was, and that I, when I started at ESMOD, I was like just so bad at respecting deadlines. So I had like the worst grades at first and it, they just like taught me that in the, 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 the real world, like in the, the, the industry, you have to respect the deadlines. Like as a freelance, if you don't respect the deadlines, you don't get paid. So like, just like respect the deadlines. That's the thing that I learned the most, I think. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah, that. that. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's great advice. <laughs> and I think that's true in any career, truly. <laughs> um, how about you, Francesco? Do you have anything uh, that stuck with you that you've used uh, in your career that, uh, that you've taken away from your estimate education? Well, I think for me, the most important thing is that um, how important it is to have a broader vision of the different aspects of the process. So, that important um, pattern making is as important as design it is as important as communication and that nothing is just disconnected everything is really connected and being able to piece it together it's really what gives you possibilities to do many things and to do things properly and well Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, we at ESMUD, uh, as Paulina mentioned at the very beginning of our, of our round table um, on our design side, we teach both pattern making and design uh, together. Um, and I think it's really important that our students get a view of that. Even our fashion business students, they, they get some of uh, their fashion culture uh, and they learn a lot of what, uh, what our design students learn in their, in their very first year design classes because it's really important, um, whether you're a designer, whether you're on the fashion design or fashion business side, to know what you're talking about and to, uh, and to be able to have a, a full view of, uh, of what it is that you're either going to be making or selling or, or merchandising or distributing or producing. So um, that's really important. Thank you. Um, so again, to those of you watching at home, if you have any questions, uh, either for us, uh, Paulina or myself, or Jean-Charles, who is also still with us, um, or for any of our alums, you can feel free to ask them, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, and we have one more question uh, at the moment, uh, again, for our alums that are with us today. Um, did you have either a favorite or least favorite class while you were at us? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we start online first? Let's go. Uh, yeah. Let's go back to Francesco. Francesco, did you have either a favorite or a least favorite class that you want to tell us about? Um, I would say, well, <laughs> least favorite. Uh, let's start was the um, uh, what's called the fit technique. So, but I have to be honest. At the end of the day it was really helpful. So coming from like a very maybe creative mind to, to be asked to, you know, put all the different like technical style of the garment together was not really fun. But to be honest, it was really, it's really important, especially when you start working, it needs to be thought of. And uh, that was really something that I didn't like at first, but <laughs> became very useful. Um, favorite, I would say, like, for me, was really pattern making because um, from the idea, from something that you had in mind, you were, like, you were able to kind of, like, go through, like, different, like, trials to, to make it come true. So I feel like that's the beautiful thing of creating from idea to real uh, garments, real products. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, really interesting also because it is true that even though you may not like or enjoy a subject does not mean that it is not useful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's so true. Don't poo-poo it right away. <laughs> um, let's go back to uh, Teo. Teo, can you tell us about either your favorite and or least favorite course from uh, from your time at SMUD? Yeah, I have to agree with Francesco on pattern making as my favorite like um, subject because it's really the moment that you've, you... you, you you discover like your your drawing in 3D and you just like learn all the process between like what you see on the pictures and how you have to do, to, to, I don't know, like build it on a paper and then on garment and, and then sew it and everything. So I don't know, that was like the, um, the, 
yeah, the, the, the thing that I enjoy the most, um, yep, yeah, yeah, definitely. And as far as the, as the least, I don't know. Like, I don't know what's the least because I don't want to like frustrate my teachers that that was there. So like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really have like a, a specific list. Um, yeah, I don't know. No, not really. <laughs> All positive things. We like to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> good. That's good. Yeah. I think jean Charles would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, Inez, will you tell us, uh, do you have a, a favorite and or least favorite course to tell us about? Yeah, it's the same than Francesco and Theo, and uh, I add to the fashion culture, because uh, in uh, Esmod Fashion Design we have this, this course, and it's really great because you can learn many more about the gunman, about the beginning, uh, and that it was very interesting too. Thank you. All right, to you, Anna. Um, well, I haven't done the fashion design course, <laughs> so <laughs> for me, I guess, actually the most challenging class was the sourcing class. Um, it was it was very, very important, but it was very hard for me to just connect myself to this whole thing. Mm -hmm. But and then as well, just like for you guys, the most challenging class, it is very, very important and there's no business that goes, you know, without design or known sourcing or textiles production. Yeah. Um, and then the second kind of maybe most challenging was the finance and law class, mm. uh, which is understandable, but at the same time, this is what I do now and I absolutely <laughs> love it. So it's kind <laughs> of, you know, it's, <laughs> it all started with doing this math calculations. I was like, oh my God. But then now it's, I absolutely love it and then I guess the most um, interesting it's it's really hard to say because it's already it's a creative fashion school it's pretty much everything here is interesting and uh, favorable mm -hmm. at that matter but um, I believe that the history class exactly that um, I've been I had for the first two years that just opens your mind on, on many many fashion brands you probably didn't even know before or many perspectives that you haven't heard and then the digital marketing classes of course um, you know right now in this world uh, we have to know different strategies and just the amount of things that we've been taught to and details and um, you know strategies it's it's really really interesting cool thank you <laughs> what I would like to, to I mean uh, take from what you have said is uh, in both formations or in both areas design and business uh, what we offer throughout the different programs is a very strong skill set mm -hmm. that you can use. Absolutely. Uh, besides, if you like one area or one specific talking more than more than the other, <laughs> I understand that. Well, that's life, you know. You there are things that you like more than others. But at the end of the day, you will be graduating and going into the into the market with a very strong skill set, and I think that's key. And now, and, and it's also great that you realize that now, now that you're working in the real world, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so how useful those areas, those topics, those skills are, and and how even you maybe you're uh, learning how to enjoy them, and that's also something that it's really nice to to hear. You see that you are growing into your a professional world and you are starting to you know use all that stuff that at the beginning may look different and not connected as a whole as part of who you are and your prof professional you know uh, capital let's say absolutely i don't think you know in in expression that the education that is too broad even really exists because uh, it seems like maybe there's so much to learn but at the end of the day there's never going to be a stop button, you know, you, you always yeah. have to learn and no matter what you do, whether you're a designer, whether you're more business, commercial oriented in the future, you will have to learn all of the things, you know, to participate in this uh, conversation, you know, here you, you will have to remind yourself of a few things, so you'll have to rehear the things that, oh, right, we, you know, we've done this, we've talked about this and it's always going to be here, so. It's a mindset Absolutely. of learn, being open to learn, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. And very important, uh, again, not just for the fashion industry, but just for life in general. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, thank you so much um, to our distinguished alums for being here with us today. Uh, thank you as well to Itsuko for joining us and for shedding some light on, uh, on her side of things in terms of recruitment. Uh, thank you as well to Paulina and Jean Charles for joining me here today and, uh, and helping uh, broaden this discussion even further. Um, thank you. 
all of you watching at home for joining us for this round table on career paths in the fashion and luxury industries. We've really enjoyed having you. We hoped you've gotten something out of this uh, discussion. If you would like to keep in touch with SMUD, we hope that you will. Um, we are on uh, many different social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and yes, TikTok. <laughs> um, so keep in, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, you may know me as the blonde on the SMUD Paris TikTok. That's great. Yep. Um, we often do uh, digital events and physical events um, that you will find out about uh, on our social medias. Um, so we hope that uh, that you'll take a look at that. Uh, and coming up very soon, uh, next week, we have a digital introductory workshop in fashion design. The following week, we will have a digital introductory workshop to fashion business. For those of you interested in learning a little bit more about uh, the concrete of what it is that we teach here at SMUD um, and if that would uh, work for you. So the registrations for that are currently on our website. You can go check that out. Um, and uh, if you would like to contact us in admissions directly and get more information on an individual um, level, you can absolutely feel free to do that. You can either call SMUD or you can send us an email at contact at smud.com. We are happy to set up individual uh, Zoom FaceTime calls with you as well. Uh, and we are here to answer any questions that you might have about uh, SMED fashion design or fashion business and life in Paris. Um, once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope you have an excellent rest of your day. And uh, that concludes our digital roundtable on career paths in the fashion and luxury industries. Merci. Thank au revoir. Au revoir. Merci. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Are we off?